A World is Born by Lee Brackett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A World is Born by Lee Brackett. Mel Gray flung down his hoe with a sudden tigerish fierceness and stood erect. Tom Ward, working beside him, glanced at Gray's Indianesque profile, the youth of it hardened by war and the hells of the Eros prison blocks. A quick flash of satisfaction crossed Ward's dark eyes. Then he grinned and said mockingly, "'Hell of a place to spend the rest of your life, ain't it?' Mel Gray stared with slitted blue eyes down the valley. The huge sun of mercury seared his naked body. Sweat channeled the dust on his skin. His throat ached with thirst. And the bitter landscape mocked him more than Wade's dark face. "'The rest of my life,' he repeated softly. "'The rest of my life!' He was twenty-eight. Wade spat in the damp black earth. "'You ought to be glad, helping the unfortunate, building a haven for the derelict. Shut up!' Fury rose in gray, hotter than the boiling springs that ran from the sunside to water the valleys. He hated Mercury. He hated John Moulton and his daughter Jill, who had conceived this plan of building a new world for the destitute and desperate veterans of the Second Interplanetary War. "'I've had enough unselfish service,' he whispered. "'I'm serving myself from now on.' Escape. That was all he wanted. Escape from these stifling valleys, from the snarl of the wind in barren crags that towered higher than Everest into airless space. Escape from the surveillance of the twenty guards, the forced companionship of the ninety-nine other veteran convicts. Wade poked at the furrows between the sturdy hybrid tubers. "'It ain't possible, kid. Not even for Duke Gray the light-fingered genius who held the interstellar police at a standstill for five years." He laughed. "'I read your publicity.' Gray stroked slow, earth-stained fingers over his sleek cap of yellow hair. "'You think so?' he asked softly. Dio the Martian came down the furrow, his lean, wiry figure silhouetted against the upper panorama of the valley. The neat rows of vegetables and the green rite of Venusian wheat dotted with toiling men and their friendly guards. Dio's green, narrowed eyes studied Gray's hard face. "'What's the matter, Gray? Trying to start something?' "'Suppose I were?' asked Gray silkily. Dio was the unofficial leader of the convict veterans. There was about his thin body and hatchet face some of the grim determination that had made the Martians cling to their dying world and bring life to it again. "'You volunteered like the rest of us,' said the Martian. "'Haven't you the guts to stick it?' "'The hell I volunteered! The IPA sent me! And what's it to you?' "'Only this!' Dio's green eyes were slitted and ugly. "'You've only been here a month. The rest of us came nearly a year ago, because we wanted to. We've worked like slaves because we wanted to. In three weeks the crops will be in. The Molten Project will be self-supporting. Molten will get his permanent charter and we'll be on our way. There are ninety-nine of us, Gray, who want the Molten Project to succeed. We know that that louse Karen of Mars doesn't want it to, since Pitchblend was discovered. We don't know whether you're working for him or not, but you're a troublemaker. There isn't to be any trouble, Gray. We're not giving the Interplanetary Prison Authority any excuse to revoke its decision and give Karen of Mars a free hand here. We'll see to anyone who tries it. Understand?" Mel Gray took one slow step forward, but Ward's sharp, Stow it! A guard! stopped him. The Martian worked back up the furrow. The guard, reassured, strolled back up the valley, squinting at the jagged streak of pale gray sky that was going black as low clouds formed, 
only a few hundred feet above the copper cables that ran from cliff to cliff high over their heads. "'Another storm,' growled Ward. "'It gets worse as Mercury enters perihelion. Lovely world, ain't it?' "'Why did you volunteer?' asked Gray, picking up his hoe. Ward shrugged. "'I had my reasons.' Gray voiced the question that had troubled him since his transfer. There were hundreds on the waiting list to replace the man who died. Why did they send me instead? Some fool blunder, said Ward carelessly, and then, in the same casual tone, You mean it, about escaping? Gray stared at him. What's it to you? Ward moved closer. I can help you. A stab of mingled hope and wary suspicion transfixed Gray's heart. Ward's dark face grinned briefly into his, with a flash of secretive black eyes, and Gray was conscious of distrust. "'What do you mean, help me?' Dee was working closer, watching them. The first growl of thunder rattled against the cliff faces. It was dark now, the pink flames of the dark-side aurora visible beyond the valley mouth. "'I've got connections,' returned Ward cryptically. "'Interested?' Gray hesitated. There was too much he couldn't understand. Moreover, he was a lone wolf. Had been, since the Second Interplanetary War wrenched him from the quiet backwater of his country home an eternity of eight years before, and hammered him into hardness, a cynic who trusted nobody and nothing but Mel Duke Gray. "'If you have connections,' he said slowly, "'why don't you use them yourself?' "'I got my reasons.' Again that secretive grin. But it's no hide-off you, is it? All you want is to get away." That was true. It would do no harm to hear what Ward had to say. Lightning burst overhead, streaking down to be caught and grounded by the copper cables. The livid flare showed Dio's face, hard with worry and determination. Gray nodded. "'Tonight, then,' whispered Ward, "'in the barracks.' Out from the cleft where Mel Gray worked, across the flat plain of rock stripped naked by the wind that raved across it, lay the deep valley that sheltered the heart of the Molten Project. Hot springs joined to form a steaming river. Vegetation grew savagely under the huge sun. The air, kept at almost constant temperature by the blanketing effect of the hot springs, was stagnant and heavy. But up above, High over the copper cables that crossed every valley where men ventured, the eternal wind of Mercury screamed and snarled between the naked cliffs. Three concrete domes crouched on the valley floor, housing barracks, tool shops, kitchens, storehouses, and executive quarters, connected by underground passages. Beside the smallest dome, joined to it by a heavily barred tunnel, was an insulated hangar containing the only spaceship on Mercury. In the small dome, John Moulton leaned back from a pile of reports, took a pinch of Martian snuff, sneezed lustily, and said, "'Jill, I think we've done it.' The gray-eyed, black-haired young woman turned from the quartzite window through which she had been watching the gathering storm overhead. The thunder from other valleys reached them as a dim barrage, which, at this time of Mercury's year, was never still. "'I don't know,' she said. "'It seems that nothing can happen now, and yet it's been too easy.' "'Easy?' snorted Moulton. "'We've broken our backs fighting these valleys, and our nerves fighting time. But we've licked them. He rose, shaggy gray hair tousled gray eyes alight. I told the IPA those men weren't criminals. And I was right. They can't deny me the charter now, no matter how much Karen of Mars would like to get his claws on this radium. He took Jill by the shoulders and shook her, laughing. Three weeks, girl, that's all. First crops ready for harvest. First pay or coming out of the mines. In three weeks, my permanent charter will have to be granted, 
according to the agreement, and then... Jill, he added solemnly, we are seeing the birth of a world. That's what frightens me. Jill glanced upward as the first flare of lightning struck down, followed by a crash of thunder that shook the dome. So much can happen at a birth. I wish the three weeks were over. Nonsense, girl! What could possibly happen?" She looked at the copper cables, burning with the electricity running along them, and thought of the one hundred and twenty-two souls in that narrow twilight belt, with the fierce heat of the sunside before them and the spatial cold of the shadow-side at their backs, fighting against wind and storm and heat to build a world to replace the ones the war had taken from them. "'So much could happen,' she whispered. An accident, an escape. The interdome telescreen buzzed its signal. Jill, caught in a queer mood of premonition, went to it. The face of Dio the Martian appeared on the screen, still wet and dirty from the storm soaked fields, disheveled from his battle across the plain in the chaotic winds. I want to see you, Miss Moulton, he said. There's something funny I think you ought to know. Of course said Jill, and met her father's eyes. I think we'll see now which one of us is right. The barracks were quiet, except for the mutter of distant thunder and the heavy breathing of exhausted men. Tom Ward crouched in the darkness by Mel Gray's bunk. "'You ain't gonna go soft at the last minute, are you?' he whispered. "'Because I can't afford to take chances.' "'Don't worry,' Gray returned grimly. What's your proposition? I can give you the combination to the lock of the hangar passage. All you have to do is get into Moulton's office, where the passage door is, and go to it. The ship's a two-seater. You can get her out of the valley easy." Gray's eyes narrowed in the dark. What's the catch? There ain't none. I swear it. Look, Ward, I'm no fool. Who's behind this, and why? That don't make no difference. All you want— Ow! Gray's fingers had fastened like steel claws on his wrist. I get it now, said Gray slowly. That's why I was sent here. Somebody wanted me to make trouble for Moulton. His fingers tightened agonizingly, and his voice sank to a slow drawl. I don't like being a pawn in somebody else's chess game. Okay, okay. It ain't my fault. Let me go." Ward rubbed his bruised wrist. Sure, somebody, I ain't saying who, sent you here, knowing you'd want to escape. I'm here to help you. You get free, I get paid, the big boy gets what he wants. Okay?" Gray was silent, scowling in the darkness. Then he said, All right, I'll take a chance. Then listen. You tell Moulton you have a complaint. I'll—' Light flooded the dark as the door clanged open. Ward leaped like a startled rabbit, but the light speared him, held him. Ward felt a pulse of excitement beat up in him. The long, ominous shadows of the guards raised elongated guns. The barracks stirred and muttered like a vast aviary waking. "'Ward and Gray,' said one of the guards, "'Moulton wants you.' Gray rose from his bunk with the lithe, delicate grace of a cat. The monotony of sleep and labor was ended. Something had broken. Life was once again a moving thing. John Moulton sat behind the untidy desk. Dio the Martian sat grimly against the wall. There was a guard beside him, watching. Mel Gray noted all this as he and Ward came in. But his cynical blue eyes went beyond to a door with a ponderous combination lock. Then they were attracted by something else, the tall, slim figure standing against the black quartz panes of the far wall. It was the first time he had seen Jill Moulton. She looked the perfect, sober apostle of righteousness he'd learned to mock. And then he saw the soft cluster of black curls, the curve of her throat above the dark dress the red lips that balanced her determined jaw and direct gray eyes. 
Moulton spoke, his shaggy head hunched between his shoulders. Dio tells me that you, Gray, are not a volunteer. Tattletale, said Gray. He was gauging the distance to the hangar door, the positions of the guards, the time it would take to spin out the combination, and he knew he couldn't do it. What were you and Ward up to when the guards came? I couldn't sleep, said Gray amiably. He was telling me bedtime stories. Jill Moulton was lovely, he couldn't deny that. Lovely, but not soft. She gave him an idea. Moulton's jaw clamped. Cut the comedy, Gray. Are you working for Karen of Mars? Karen of Mars, chairman of the board of the Interplanetary Prison Authority. Dio had mentioned him. Gray smiled in understanding. Karen of Mars had sent him, Gray, to Mercury. Karen of Mars was helping him through Ward to escape. Karen of Mars wanted Mercury for his own purposes, and he could have it. In a manner of speaking, Mr. Moulton, he said gravely, Karen of Mars is working for me. He caught Ward's sharp hiss of remonstrance. Then Jill Moulton stepped forward. Perhaps he doesn't understand what he's doing, father. Her eyes met Gray's. You want to escape, don't you? Gray studied her, grinning as the slow rose flushed her skin, the corners of her mouth tightened with anger. Go on, he said. You have a nice voice. Her eyes narrowed, but she held her temper. You must know what that would mean, Gray. There are thousands of veterans in the prisons now. Their offenses are mostly trivial, but the prison authority can't let them go because they have no jobs, no homes, no money. The valleys here are fertile. There are mines rich in copper and pitchblende. The men have a chance for a home and a job, a part in building a new world. We hope to make Mercury an independent, self-governing member of the League of Worlds." "'With the Moltons as rulers, of course,' Gray murmured. If they want us," answered Jill, deliberately missing the point. Do you think you have the right to destroy all we've worked for? Gray was silent. Rather grimly, she went on. Karen of Mars would like to see us defeated. He didn't care about Mercury before radium was discovered. But now he'd like to turn it into a prison mining community, with convict labor, leasing mine grants to corporations and cleaning up big fortunes for himself and his associates. Any trouble here will give him an excuse to say that we've failed, that the project is a menace to the solar system. If you try to escape, you wreck everything we've done. If you don't tell the truth, you may cost thousands of men their futures. Do you understand? Will you cooperate?" Gray said evenly, I'm my own keeper now. My brother will have to take care of himself." It was ridiculously easy. She was so earnest, so close to him. He had a brief kaleidoscope of impressions. Ward's sullen bewilderment, Moulton's angry roar, Dio's jerky rise to his feet as the guards grabbed for their guns. Then he had his hands around her slim, firm throat, her body pressed close to his, serving as a shield against bullets. Don't be rash," he told them all quietly. I can break her neck quite easily if I have to. Ward, unlock that door. In utter silence, Ward darted over and began to spin the dial. At last he said, OK, come on. Gray realized that he was sweating. Jill was like warm, rigid marble in his hands. And he had another idea. I'm going to take the girl as a hostage he announced. If I get safely away, she'll be turned loose, her health and virtue still intact. Good night." The clang of the heavy door had a comforting sound behind them. The ship was a commercial job, fairly slow but sturdy. Gray strapped Jill Moulton into one of the bucket seats in the control room and then checked the fuel and air gauges. The tanks were full. "'What about you?' he said to Ward. You can't go back. 
Nah, I'll have to go with you. Warm her up, Duke, while I open the dome." He darted out. Gray set the atmosphere motors idling. The dome slid open, showing the flicker of the auroras, where areas of intense heat and cold set up atmospheric tension by rapid fluctuation of adjoining air masses. Mercury, cutting the vast magnetic field of the sun in an eccentric orbit, tortured by the daily change from blistering heat to freezing cold in the thin atmosphere, was a powerful generator of electricity. Ward didn't come back. Swearing under his breath, tense for the sound of pursuit in spite of the girl, Gray went to look. Out beyond the hangar he saw a figure running. Running hard up into the narrowing cleft of the valley where natural galleries in the rock of Mercury led to the places where the copper cables were anchored, and farther into the unexplored mystery of the caves. Gray scowled, his arrogant Roman profile hard against the flickering aurora. Then he slammed the lock shut. The ship roared out into the tearing winds of the plain. Gray cut in his rockets and blasted up, into the airless dark among the high peaks. Jill Moulton hadn't moved or spoken. Gray snapped on the space radio, leaving his own screen dark. Presently he picked up signals in a code he didn't know. "'Listen,' he said. "'I knew there was some reason for Ward's running out on me.' His Indianesque face hardened. "'So that's the game. They want to make trouble for you by letting me escape, and then make themselves heroes by bringing me in, preferably dead. They've got ships waiting to get me as soon as I clear Mercury, and they're getting standby instructions from somebody on the ground, the somebody that Ward was making for.' Jill's breath made a small hiss. "'Somebody's near the project,' Gray snapped on his transmitter. "'Duke Gray, calling all ships off Mercury. Will the flagship of your reception committee please come in?' His screen flickered to life. A man's face appeared, the middle-aged, soft-fleshed, almost stickily innocent face of one of the solar system's greatest crusaders against vice and crime. Jill Moulton gasped. "'Karen of Mars!' "'Ward gave the game away,' said Gray gently. "'Too bad.' The face of Karen of Mars never changed expression, but behind those flesh-hooded eyes was a cunning brain, working at top speed. "'I have a passenger,' Gray went on. "'Miss Jill Moulton. I'm responsible for her safety, and I'd hate to have her inconvenienced.' The tip of a pale tongue flicked across Karen's pale lips. "'That is a pity,' he said, with the intonation of a preaching minister. "'But I cannot stop the machinery set in motion.' "'And besides,' finished Gray acidly, "'you think that if Jill Moulton dies with me it'll break John Moulton so he won't fight you at all.' His lean hand poised on the switch. "'All right, you putrid flesh-tub. Try and catch us." The screen went dead. Gray hunched over the controls. If he could get past them, lose himself in the glare of the sun. He looked aside at the stony-faced girl beside him. She was studying him contemptuously out of hard gray eyes. How, she said slowly, can you be such a callous swine? Callous? He controlled the quite unreasonable anger that rose in him. Not at all. The war taught me that if I didn't look out for myself, no one would. And yet you must have started out a human being. He laughed. The ship burst into searing sunlight. The sun side of Mercury blazed below them. Out toward the velvet dark of space the side of a waiting ship flashed burning silver. Even as he watched, the flare of its rockets arced against the blackness. They had been sighted. Gray's practiced eye gauged the stranger's speed against his own, and he cursed softly. Abruptly he wheeled the ship and started down again, cutting his rockets as the shadow swallowed them. The ship was eerily silent, dropping with a rising scream as the atmosphere touched the hull. "'What are you going to do?' asked Jill, almost too quietly. He didn't answer. 
maneuvering the ship on velocity between those stupendous pinnacles took all his attention. Karen, at least, couldn't follow him in the dark without exhaust flares as guides. They swept across the wind-torn plain, into the mouth of the valley where Gray had worked, breaking hard to a stop under the cables. "'You might have got past them,' said Jill. "'One chance in a hundred. Her mouth twisted. "'Afraid to take it?' He smiled harshly. "'I haven't yet reached the stage where I kill women. You'll be safe here. The men will find you in the morning. I'm going back, alone.' "'Safe,' she said bitterly. "'For what? No matter what happens, the project is ruined.' "'Don't worry,' he told her brutally. "'You'll find some other way to make a living.' Her eyes blazed. "'You think that's all it means to us? Just money and power?' she whispered. "'I hope they kill you, Duke Gray.' He rose lazily and opened the airlock, then turned and freed her. And sharply the valley was bathed in a burst of light. "'Damn!' Gray picked up the sound of air motors overhead. They must have had infrared search beams. Well, that does it. We'll have to run for it, since this bus isn't armed. With eerie irrelevancy the teleradio buzzed. At this time of night, after the evening storms, some communication was possible. Gray had a hunch. He opened the switch, and the face of John Moulton appeared on the screen. It was white and oddly still. "'Our guard saw your ship across the plain,' said Moulton quietly. "'The men of the project, led by Dio, are coming for you. I sent them, because I have decided that the life of my daughter is less important than the lives of many thousands of people. I appeal to you, Gray, to let her go. Her life won't save you, and it's very precious to me.' Karen's ship swept over, low above the cables, and the grindy concussion of a bomb lifted the ship, hurled it down with the stern end twisted to uselessness. The screen went dead. Gray caught the half-stunned girl. "'I wish to heaven I could get rid of you,' he grated, "'and I don't know why I don't.' But she was with him when he set out down the valley, making for the cliff caves up where the copper cables were anchored. Karen's ship, a fast small fighter, wheeled between the cliffs and turned back. Gray dropped flat, holding the girl down. Bombs pelted them with dirt and uprooted vegetables, started fires in the wheat. The pilot found a big enough break in the cables and came in for a landing. Gray was up and running again. He knew the way into the explored galleries. From there on it was anybody's guess. Karen was brazen enough about it. The subtle way had failed. Now he was going all out. And he was really quite safe. With the broken cables to act as conductors, the first thunderstorm would obliterate all proof of his activities in this valley. Mercury, because of its high electrical potential, was cut off from communication with other worlds. Moulton, even if he had knowledge of what went on, could not send for help. Gray wondered briefly what Karen intended to do in case he, Gray, made good his escape. That outpost in the main valley, for which Ward had been heading, wasn't kept for fun. Besides, Karen was too smart to have only one string to his bow. Shouts, the spatter of shots around them. The narrow trail loomed above. Gray sent the girl scrambling up. The sun burst up over the high peaks leaving the black shadow of the valley still untouched. Karen's ship roared off, but six of its crew came after Gray and Jill Moulton. The chill dark of the tunnel-mouth swallowed them. Keeping right to avoid the great copper post that held the cables, strung through holes drilled in the solid rock of the gallery's outer wall, Gray urged the girl along. The cleft his hand was searching for opened. Drawing the girl inside, around a jutting shoulder, he stopped, listening. Footsteps echoed outside, grew louder, swept by. There was no light, but the steps were too sure to have been made in the dark. "'Infrared torches and goggles,' Gray said tersely. "'You see, but your quarry doesn't. Useful gadget. 
Come on. But where? What are you going to do? Escape, girl, remember? They smashed my ship. But there must be another one on Mercury. I'm going to find it." I don't understand. You probably never will. Here's where I leave you. That Martian Galahad will be along any minute. He'll take you home." Her voice came soft and puzzled through the dark. I don't understand you, Gray. You wouldn't risk my life, yet you're turning me loose, knowing that I might save you, knowing that I'll hunt you down if I can. I thought you were a hardened cynic. What makes you think I'm not? If you were, you'd have kicked me out the waste tubs of the ship and gone on. You'd never have turned back." I told you, he said roughly, I don't kill women. He turned away, but her harsh chuckle followed him. You're a fool, Gray. You've lost truth, and you aren't even true to your lie. He paused, in swift anger. Voices, the sound of running men, came up from the path. He broke into a silent run, following the dying echoes of Karen's men. Run, Gray! cried Jill, because we're coming after you. The tunnels, ancient blowholes for the volcanic gases that had tortured Mercury with the raising of the titanic mountains, sprawled in a labyrinthine network through those same vast peaks. Only the galleries lying next the valleys had been explored. Man's habitation on Mercury had been too short. Gray could hear Karen's men circling about through connecting tunnels, searching. It proved what he had already guessed. He was taking a desperate chance. But the way back was closed, and he was used to taking chances. The geography of the district was clear in his mind. The valley he had just left and the main valley, forming an obtuse angle with the apex out on the wind-torn plain and a double range of mountains lying out between the sides of the triangle. Somewhere there was a passage through those peaks. Somewhere there was a landing place, and ten to one there was a ship on it. Karen would never have left his men stranded, on the off chance that they might be discovered and used in evidence against him. The men now hunting him knew their way through the tunnels, probably with the aid of markings that fluoresced under infrared light. They were going to take him through, too. They were coming closer. He waited far up in the main gallery, in the mouth of a side tunnel. Now behind them he could hear Dio's men. The noise of Karen's outfit stopped, then began again softly. Gray smiled, his sense of humor pleased. He tensed, waiting. The rustle of cloth, the furtive creak of leather, the clink of metal equipment. Heavy breathing. Somebody whispered, who the hell's that back there? Must be men from the project. We'd better hurry. We've got to find that damned Gray first," snapped the first voice grimly. Karen'll burn us if we don't. Gray counted six separate footsteps, trying to allow for the echoes. When he was sure the last man was by, he stepped out. The noise of Dio's hunt was growing. There must be a good many of them. Covered by their own echoes, he stole up on the men ahead. His groping hand brushed gently against the clothing of the last man in the group. Gauging his distance swiftly, he went into action. One hand fastened over the fellow's mouth. The other, holding a good-sized rock, struck down behind the ear. Gray eased the body down with scarcely a sound. Their uniforms, he had noticed, were not too different from his prison garb. In a second he had stripped goggles, cap and gun-belt from the body and was striding after the others. They moved like five eerie shadows now, in the queer light of the leader's lamp. Small fluorescent markings guided them. The last man grunted over his shoulder, "'What happened to you?' "'Stumbled,' whispered Gray tersely, keeping his head down. A whisper is a good disguise for the voice." The other nodded. "'Don't straggle. No fun getting lost in here." The leader broke in. "'We'll circle again. Be careful of that project bunch. They'll be using ordinary light. And be quiet.' They went through connecting passages. The noise of Dio's party grew ominously loud. Abruptly the leader swore. 
Karen or no Karen, he's gone. And we better go, too." He turned off down a different tunnel, and Gray heaved a sigh of relief, remembering the body he'd left in the open. For a time the noise of their pursuers grew remote, and then suddenly there was an echoing clamor of footsteps and the glare of torches on the wall of a cross-passage ahead. Voices came to Gray, distorted by the rock vaults. I'm sure I heard them just then. It was Jill's voice. Yeah, that was Dio. The trouble is, where? The footsteps halted. Then, let's try this passage. We don't want to get too far into this maze. Karen's leader blasphemed softly and dodged into a side tunnel. The man next to Gray stumbled and cried out with pain as he struck the wall and a shout rose behind them. The leader broke into a run, twisting, turning, diving into the maze of smaller tunnels. The sounds of pursuit faded, were lost in the tomb-like silence of the caves. One of the men laughed. "'We sure lost him. "'Yeah,' said the leader, "'we lost him all right.' Gray caught the note of panic in his voice. "'We lost the markers, too.' "'You mean, yeah, turning off like that did it.' Unless we can find that marked tunnel, we're sunk." Gray, silent in the shadows, laughed a bitter, ironic laugh. They went on, stumbling down endless black halls, losing all track of branching corridors, straining to catch the first glint of saving light. Once or twice they caught the echoes of Dio's party, and knew that they too were lost and wandering. Then, quite suddenly, they came out into a vast gallery, running like a subway tube straight to left and right. A wind tore down it, hot as a draft from the burning gates of hell. It was a moment before anyone grasped the significance of that wind. Then someone shouted, "'We're saved! All we have to do is walk against it!' They turned left, almost running in the teeth of that searing blast and Gray began to notice a peculiar thing. The air was charged with electricity. His clothing stiffened and crackled. His hair crawled on his head. He could see the faint discharges of sparks from his companions. Whether it was the effect of the charged air, or the reaction from the nervous strain of the past hours, Mel Gray began to be afraid. Weary to exhaustion, they struggled on against the burning wind and then they blundered out into a cave, huge as a cathedral, lighted by a queer, uncertain bluish light. Gray caught the sharp smell of ozone. His whole body was tingling with electric tension. The bluish light seemed to be in indeterminate lumps scattered over the rocky floor. The rush of the wind under that tremendous vault was terrifying. They stopped, Gray keeping to the background. Now was the time to evade his unconscious helpers. The moment they reached daylight, he'd be discovered. Soft-footed as a cat, he was already hidden among the heavy shadows of the fluted walls, when he heard the voices. They came from off to the right, a confused shout of men under fearful strain, growing louder and louder, underscored with the tramp of footsteps. Lights blazed suddenly in the cathedral dark and from the mouth of a great tunnel some hundred yards away, the men of the project poured into the cave. And then, sharp and high and unexpected, a man screamed. The lumps of blue light were moving. And a man had died. He lay on the rock, his flesh black and jelly, with a rope of glowing light running from the metal of his gun butt to the metal buttons on his cap. All across the vast floor of that cavern the slow, eerie ripple of motion grew. The scattered lumps melted and flowed together, converging in wavelets of blue flame upon the men. The answer came to Gray. Those things were some form of energy life, born of the tremendous electric tensions on Mercury. Like all electricity, they were attracted to metal. In a sudden frenzy of motion, he ripped off his metal-framed goggles, his cap and gun-belt. The Moltons forbade metal because of the danger of lightning, and his boots were made of rubber, so he felt reasonably safe 
but a tense fear ran in prickling waves across his skin. Guns began to bark, their feeble thunder all but drowned in the vast rush of the wind. Bullets struck the oncoming waves of light with no more effect than the eruption of a shower of sparks. Gray's attention somehow was riveted on Jill, standing with Dio at the head of her men. She wore ordinary light slippers, having been dressed only for indoors. And there were silver ornaments at waist and throat. He might have escaped then, quite unnoticed. Instead, for a reason even he couldn't understand, he ran for Jill Moulton. The first ripples of blue fire touched the ranks of Dio's men. Bolts of it leaped upward to fasten upon gun butts and the buckles of cartridge belts. Men screamed, fell, and died. An arm of the fire licked out, driving in behind Dio and the girl. The guns of Karen's four remaining men were silent now. Gray leaped over that hissing electric surf, running toward Jill. A hungry worm of light reared up, searching for Dio's gun. Gray's hand swept it down, to be instantly buried in a mass of glowing ropes. Dio's hatchet face snarled at him in startled anger. Jill cried out as Gray tore the silver ornaments from her dress. "'Throw down the guns!' he yelled. "'It's metal they want!' He heard his name shouted by men torn momentarily from their own terror. Dio cried, "'Shoot him!' A few bullets whined past, but their immediate fear spoiled both aim and attention. Gray caught up Jill and began to run, toward the tube from which the wind howled in the cave. Behind him, grimly, Dio followed. The electric beasts didn't notice him. His insulated feet trampled through them, buried to the ankle in living flame, feeling queer, tenuous bodies break and reform. The wind met them like a physical barrier at the tunnel mouth. Gray put Jill down. The wind strangled him. He tore off his coat and wrapped it over the girl's head, using his shirt over his own. Jill, her black curls whipped straight, tried to fight back past him, and he saw Dio coming, bent double against the wind. He saw something else, something that made him grab Jill and point, his flesh crawling with swift, cold dread. The electric beasts had finished their pleasure. The dead were cinders on the rock. The living had run back into the tunnels, and now the blue sea of fire was flowing again straight toward the place where they stood. It was flowing fast, and Gray sensed an urgency, an impersonal haste, as though a command had been laid upon those living ropes of flame. The first dim rumble of thunder rolled down the wind. Gripping Jill, Gray turned up the tunnel. The wind, compressed in that narrow throat of rock, beat them blind and breathless, beat them to their bellies to crawl. How long it took them, he never knew. But Gray caught glimpses of Dio the Martian crawling behind them, and behind him again the relentless flow of the fire things. They floundered out onto a rocky slope, fell away beneath the suck of the wind, and lay still, gasping. It was hot. Thunder crashed abruptly, and lightning flared between the cliffs. Gray felt a contracting of the heart there were no cables. Then he saw it, the small, fast fighter flying below them on a flat plateau. A cave-mouth beside it had been closed with a plastic door. The ship was one that had followed them. He guessed at another one behind the protecting door. Raking the tumbled blonde hair out of his eyes, Gray got up. Jill was still sitting, her black curls bowed between her hands. There wasn't much time, but Gray yielded to impulse. Pulling her head back by the silken hair, he kissed her. "'If you ever get tired of virtue, sweetheart, look me up.' But somehow he wasn't grinning, and he ran down the slope. He was almost to the open lock of the ship, when things began to happen. Dio staggered out of the wind tunnel and sagged down beside Jill. Then, abruptly, the big door opened. Five men came out, one in pilot's costume, two in nondescript apparel, one in expensive business clothes, and the fifth in dark prison garb. 
Gray recognized the last two, Karen of Mars and the errant Ward. They were evidently on the verge of leaving, but they looked cheerful. Karen's sickly sweet face all but oozed honey, and Ward was grinning his rat's grin. Thunder banged and rolled among the rocks, lightning flared in the cloudy murk. Gray saw the hull of a second ship beyond the door. Then the newcomers had seen him, and the two on the slope. Guns ripped out of holsters. Gray's heart began to pound slowly. He and Jill and Dio were caught up on that naked slope, with the flood of electric death at their backs. His Indianesque face hardened. Bullets whined round him as he turned back up the slope, but he ran doubled over, putting all his hope in the tricky, uncertain light. Jill and the Martian crouched stiffly, not knowing where to turn. A flare of lightning showed Gray the first of the fire-things, flowing out onto the ledge, hidden from the men below. "'Back into the cave!' he yelled. His urgent hand fairly lifted Dio. The Martian glared at him, then obeyed. Bullets snarled against the rock. The light was too bad for accurate shooting, but luck couldn't stay with them forever. Gray glanced over his shoulder as they scrambled up on the ledge. Karen waited by his ship. Ward and the others were charging the slope. Gray's teeth gleamed in a cruel grin. Sweeping Jill into his arms, he stepped into the lapping flow of fire. Dio swore viciously, but he followed. They started toward the cave mouth, staggering in the rush of the wind. "'For God's sake, don't fall!' snapped Gray. "'Here they come!' The pilot and one of the nondescript men were the first over. They were into the river of fire before they knew it, and then it was too late. One collapsed and was buried. The pilot fell backward, and the other man died under his body of a broken neck. Ward stopped. Gray could see his face, dark and hard and calculating. He studied Gray and Dio and the dead men. He turned and looked back at Karen. Then, deliberately, he stripped off his gun-belt, threw down his gun, and waded into the river. Gray remembered then that Ward too wore rubber boots and had no metal on him. Ward came on, the glowing rope sliding surf-like around his boots. Very carefully, Gray handed Jill to Dio. "'If I die too,' he said, "'there's only Karen down there. He's too fat to stop you.' Jill spoke but he turned his back. He was suddenly confused, and it was almost pleasant to be able to lose his confusion in fighting. Ward had stopped some five feet away. Now he untied the length of tough cord that served him for a belt. Gray nodded. Ward would try to throw a twist around his ankle and trip him. Once his body touched those swarming creatures, he tensed watchfully. The rat's grin was set on Ward's dark face. The cord licked out. But it caught Gray's throat instead of his ankle. Ward laughed and braced himself. Cursing, Gray caught at the rope. But friction held it, and Ward pulled hard. His face purpling, Gray could still commend Ward's strategy. In taking Gray off guard, he'd more than made up what he lost in point of leverage. Letting his body go with the pull, Gray flung himself at Ward. Blood blinded him, his heart was pounding, but he thought he foresaw Ward's next move. He let himself be pulled almost within striking distance. Then, as Ward stepped aside, jerking the rope and thrusting out a tripping foot, Gray made a cat-like shift of balance and bent over. His hands almost touched that weird flowing surf as they clasped Ward's boot. Throwing all his strength into the lift, he hurled Ward backward. Ward screamed once and disappeared under the blue fire. Gray clawed the rope from his neck, and then suddenly the world began to sway under him. He knew he was falling. Someone's hand caught him, held him up. Fighting down his vertigo as his breath came back, he saw that it was Jill. "'Why?' he gasped but her answer was lost in a titanic roar of thunder. Lightning blasted down. Dio's voice reached him, thin and distant through the clamor. "'We'll be killed! These damn things will attract the bolts!' 
It was true. All his work had been for nothing. Looking up into that low, angry sky, Gray knew he was going to die. Quite irrelevantly, Jill's words in the tunnel came back to him. You're a fool, lost truth, not true to lie. Now, in this moment, she couldn't lie to him. He caught her shoulders cruelly, trying to read her eyes. Very faintly through the uproar, he heard her. I'm sorry for you, Gray. Good man, gone to waste. Dio stifled a scream. Thunder crashed between the sounding boards of the cliffs. Gray looked up. A titanic bolt of lightning shot down, straight for them. The burning blue surf was agitated, sending up pseudopods uncannily like worshipping arms. The bolt struck. The air reeked of ozone, but Gray felt no shock. There was a hiss, a vast stirring of creatures around him. The blue light glowed, purpled. Another bolt struck down, and another, and still they were not dead. The fire-things had become a writhing, joyous tangle of tenuous bodies, glowing bright and brighter. Stunned, incredulous, the three humans stood. The light was now an eye-searing violet. Static electricity tingled through them in eerie waves. But they were not burned. "'My God!' whispered Gray. "'They eat it! They eat lightning!' Not daring to move, they stood watching that miracle of alien life, the feeding of living things on raw current. And when the last bolt had struck, the tide turned and rolled back down the wind tunnel, a blinding river of living light. Silently, the three humans went down the rocky slope to where Karen of Mars cowered in the silver ship. No bolt had come near it, and now Karen came to meet them. His face was pasty with fear but the old cunning still lurked in his eyes. "'Gray,' he said, "'I have an offer to make.' "'Well?' "'You killed my pilot,' said Karen suavely. "'I can't fly myself. Take me off, and I'll pay you anything you want.' "'In bullets,' retorted Gray. "'You won't want witnesses to this. Circumstances force me. Physically, you have the advantage." Jill's fingers caught his arm. "'Don't, Gray. The project—' Karen faced her. "'The project is doomed in any case. My men carried out my secondary instructions. All the cables in your valley have been cut. There is a storm now ready to break. In fifteen minutes or so, everything will be destroyed, except the domes. Regrettable, but— He shrugged. Jill's temper blazed, choking her so that she could hardly speak. "'Look at him, Gray,' she whispered. "'That's what you're so proud of being. A cynic who believes in nothing but himself. Look at him.' Gray turned on her. "'Damn you,' he grated. "'Do you expect me to believe you, with a world full of hypocrites like him?' Her eyes stopped him. He remembered Moulton, pleading for her life. He remembered how she had looked back there at the tunnel, when they had been sure of death. Some of his assurance was shaken. "'Listen,' he said harshly. "'I can save your valley. There's a chance in a million of coming out alive. Will you die for what you believe in?' She hesitated, just for a second. Then she looked at Dio and said, Yes. Gray turned. Almost lazily, his fist snapped up and took Karen on his flabby jaw. Take care of him, Dio, he grunted. Then he entered the ship, hurting the white-faced girl before him. The ship hurtled up into airless space, where the blinding sunlight lay in sharp shadows on the rock. Over the ridge and down again, with the project hidden under a surf of storm clouds. Cutting in the air motors, Gray dropped. Black, bellowing darkness swallowed them. Then he saw the valley, with the copper cables fallen and the wheat already on fire in several places. Flying with every bit of his skill, he sought the narrowest part of the valley and flipped over in a racking loop. The stern tubes hit rock. 
The nose slammed down on the opposite wall, wedging the ship by sheer weight. Lightning gathered in a vast javelin and flamed down upon them. Jill flinched and caught her breath. The flame hissed along the hull and vanished into seared and blackened rock. "'Still willing to die for principle?' asked Gray brutally. She glared at him. "'Yes,' she snapped. "'But I hate having to die in your company.' She looked down at the valley. Lightning struck with monotonous regularity on the hull, but the valley was untouched. Jill smiled, though her face was white, her body rigid with waiting. It was the smile that did it. Gray looked at her, her tousled black curls, the lithe young curves of throat and breast. He leaned back in his seat, scowling out at the storm. "'Relax,' he said. "'You aren't going to die.' She turned on him, not daring to speak. He went on slowly. "'The only chance you took was in the landing. We're acting as a lightning rod for the whole valley, being the highest and best conductor. But as a man named Faraday proved, the charge resides on the surface of the conductor. We're perfectly safe." "'How dared you!' she whispered. He faced her, almost angrily. "'You knock the props out from under my philosophy. I've had enough hypocritical eyewash. I had to prove you. Well, I have. She was quiet for some time. Then she said, "'I understand, Duke. I'm glad. And now what, for you?' He shrugged wryly. "'I don't know. I can still take Karen's other ship and escape. But I don't think I want to. I think, perhaps, I'll stick around and give virtue another whirl.' Smoothing back his sleek fair hair, he shot her a sparkling look from under his hands. "'I won't,' he added softly. "'Even mind going to Sunday school, if you were the teacher.'" The End of A World is Born by Lee Brackett The Spy in the Elevator by Donald E. Westlake this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spy in the Elevator by Donald E. Westlake When the elevator didn't come, that just made the day perfect. A broken egg yolk, a stuck zipper, a feedback in the aircon exhaust the window sticking at full transparency. Well, I won't go through the whole sorry list. Suffice it to say that when the elevator didn't come, that put the roof on the city, as they say. It was just one of those days. Everybody gets them. Days when you're lucky and you make it to nightfall with no bones broken. But of all times for it to happen. For literally months I'd been building my courage up, and finally, just today, I had made up my mind to do it, to propose to Linda. I'd called her second thing this morning, right after the egg yolk, and invited myself down to her place. Ten o'clock, she'd said, smiling sweetly at me out of the phone. She knew why I wanted to talk to her. And when Linda said ten o'clock, she meant ten o'clock. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean that Linda's a perfectionist or harridan or anything like that, far from it, but she does have a fixation on that one subject of punctuality. The result of her job, of course. She was an ore sled dispatcher. Ore sleds, being robots, were invariably punctual. If an ore sled didn't return on time, no one waited for it, they simply knew that it had been captured by some other project and had blown itself up. Well, of course, after working as an ore sled dispatcher for three years, Linda, quite naturally, was a bit obsessed. I remember one time, shortly after we'd started dating, when I arrived at her place five minutes late and found her having hysterics. She thought I'd been killed. She couldn't visualize anything less than that keeping me from arriving at the designated moment. When I told her what actually had happened, I'd broken a shoelace, she refused to speak to me for four days. 
And then the elevator didn't come. Until then, I'd managed somehow to keep the day's minor disasters from ruining my mood. Even while eating that horrible egg, I couldn't very well throw it away, broken yolk or no, it was my breakfast allotment and I was hungry, and while hurriedly jury-rigging drapery across that gaspingly transparent window, one hundred and fifty-three stories straight down to slag, I kept going over and over my prepared proposal speeches, trying to select the most effective one. I had a whimsical approach. Honey, I see there's a nice little non-P apartment available up on 173. And I had a romantic approach. Darling, I can't live without you at the moment. Temporarily, I'm madly in love with you. I want to share my life with you for a while. Will you be provisionally mine? I even had a straightforward approach. Linda, I'm going to be needing a wife for at least a year or two, and I can't think of anyone I would rather spend that time with than you." Actually, though I wouldn't even have admitted this to Linda, much less to anyone else, I loved her in more than a non-P way. But even if we both had been genetically desirable, neither of us were, I knew that Linda relished her freedom and independence too much to ever contract for any kind of marriage other than non-P, non-permanent, no progeny. So I rehearsed my various approaches, realizing that when the time came I would probably be so tongue-tied I'd be capable of no more than a blurted, "'Will you marry me?' and I struggled with zippers and malfunctioning air-cons, and I managed somehow to leave the apartment at five minutes to ten. Linda lived down on the hundred fortieth floor, thirteen stories away. It never took more than two or three minutes to get to her place, so I was giving myself plenty of time. But then the elevator didn't come. I pushed the button, waited, and nothing happened. I couldn't understand it. The elevator had always arrived before, within thirty seconds of the button being pushed. This was a local stop, with an elevator that traveled between the hundred thirty-third floor and the hundred sixty-seventh floor, where it was possible to make connections for either the next local or for the express. So it couldn't be more than twenty stories away. And this was a non-rush hour. I pushed the button again, and then I waited some more. I looked at my watch, and it was three minutes to ten. Two minutes and no elevator. If it didn't arrive this instant, this second, I would be late. It didn't arrive. I vacillated, not knowing what to do next. Stay, hoping the elevator would come after all? Or hurry back to the apartment and call Linda, to give her advance warning that I would be late? Ten more seconds, and still no elevator. I chose the second alternative, raced back down the hall, and thumbed my way into my apartment. I dialed Linda's number, and the screen lit up with white letters on black, Privacy Disconnection. Of course, Linda expected me at any moment, and she knew what I wanted to say to her, so quite naturally she had disconnected the phone, to keep us from being interrupted. Frantic, I dashed from the apartment again, back down the hall to the elevator, and leaned on that blasted button with all my weight. Even if the elevator should arrive right now, I would still be almost a minute late. No matter, it didn't arrive. I would have been in a howling rage anyway, but this impossibility piled on top of all the other annoyances and breakdowns of the day was just too much. I went into a frenzy and kicked the elevator door three times before I realized I was hurting myself more than I was hurting the door. I limped back to the apartment, fuming, slammed the door behind me, grabbed the phone book and looked up the number of the transit staff. I dialed, prepared to register a complaint so loud they'd be able to hear me in sub-basement three. I got some more letters that spelled, Busy. It took three tries before I got through to a hurried-looking female receptionist. "'My name is Rice,' I bellowed. "'Edmund Rice. I live on the hundred and fifty-third floor. I just rang for the elevator, and the elevator is disconnected.' She said it very rapidly, as though she were growing very used to saying it. It only stopped me for a second. Disconnected? What do you mean, disconnected? Elevators don't get disconnected, I told her. 
We will resume service as soon as possible, she rattled. My bellowing was bouncing off her like radiation off the Project Four screen. I changed tactics. First I inhaled, making a production out of it, giving myself a chance to calm down a bit. And then I asked, as rationally as you could please, would you mind terribly telling me why the elevator is disconnected? I am sorry, sir, but that— Stop, I said. I said it quietly, too, but she stopped. I saw her looking at me. She hadn't done that before. She'd merely gazed blankly at her screen and parroted her responses. But now she was actually looking at me. I took advantage of the fact. Calmly, rationally, I said to her, I would like to tell you something, miss. I would like to tell you just what you people have done to me by disconnecting the elevator. You have ruined my life." She blinked, open-mouthed. "'Ruined your life?' Precisely. I found it necessary to inhale again, even more slowly than before. "'I was on my way,' I explained, "'to propose to a girl whom I dearly love. In every way but one she is the perfect woman. Do you understand me?' She nodded, wide-eyed. I had stumbled on a romantic, though I was too preoccupied to notice it at the time. "'In every way but one,' I continued. "'She has one small imperfection, a fixation about punctuality. And I was supposed to meet her at ten o'clock. I'm late!' I shook my fist at the screen. "'Do you realize what you've done?' disconnecting the elevator. Not only won't she marry me, she won't even speak to me. Not now, not after this." "'Sir,' she said tremulously, "'please don't shout.' "'I'm not shouting!' "'Sir, I'm terribly sorry. I understand your—' "'You understand?' I trembled with speechless fury. She looked all about her, and then leaned closer to the screen, revealing a cleavage that I was too distraught at the moment to pay any attention to. "'We're not supposed to give you this information out, sir,' she said, her voice low. "'But I'm going to tell you, so you'll understand why we had to do it. I think it's perfectly awful that it had to ruin things for you this way. But the fact of the matter is—' She leaned even closer to the screen. There's a spy in the elevator. 2. It was my turn to be stunned. I just gaped at her. Uh, A what? A spy. He was discovered on the 147th floor and managed to get into the elevator before the army could catch him. He jammed it between floors but the army is doing everything it can think of to get him out." Well, but why should there be any problem about getting him out? He plugged in the manual controls. We can't control the elevator from outside at all, and when anyone tries to get into the shaft, he aims the elevator at them. That sounded impossible. He aims the elevator? He runs it up and down the shaft, she explained trying to crush anybody who goes after him. Oh, I said. So it might take a while. She leaned so close this time that even I, distracted as I was, could hardly help but take note of her cleavage. She whispered, They're afraid they'll have to starve him out. Oh, no! She nodded solemnly. I'm terribly sorry, sir, she said. Then she glanced to her right suddenly straightened up again and said, "'We will resume service as soon as possible.' Click! Blank screen. For a minute or two all I could do was sit and absorb what I'd been told. A spy in the elevator. A spy who had managed to work his way all the way up to the 147th floor before being unmasked. What in the world was the matter with the army? If things were getting that lax, the project was doomed four-screen or no. Who knew how many more spies there were in the project, still unsuspected? Until that moment, 
the state of siege in which we all lived had had no reality for me. The project, after all, was self-sufficient and completely enclosed. No one ever left, no one ever entered. Under our roof we were a nation two hundred stories high. The ever-present threat of other projects had never been more for me, or for most other people either, I suspected, than occasional oar-sleds that didn't return, occasional spies shot down as they tried to sneak into the building, occasional spies of our own leaving the project in tiny radiation-proof cars, hoping to get safely within another project and bring back news of any immediate threats and dangers that project might be planning for us. Most spies didn't return. Most oar-sleds did. And within the project life was full, the knowledge of external dangers merely lurking at the backs of our minds. After all, those external dangers had been no more than potential for decades, since what Dr. Kilbilly called the ungentlemanly gentleman's war. Dr. Kilbilly, intermediate project history when I was fifteen years old, had private names for every major war of the twentieth century. There was the ignoble nobleman's war, the racial non-racial war, and the ungentlemanly gentleman's war, known to the textbooks of course as World Wars I, II, and Three. The rise of the projects, according to Dr. Kilbilly, was the result of many, many factors, but two of the most important were the population explosion and the Treaty of Oslo. The population explosion, of course, meant that there was continuously more and more people but never any more space. So that housing, in the historically short time of one century, made a complete transformation from horizontal expansion to vertical. Before 1900 the vast majority of human beings lived in tiny huts of from one to five stories. By 2000 everybody lived in projects. From the very beginning, small attempts were made to make these projects more than dwelling places. By mid-century, projects, also called apartments and co-ops, already included restaurants, shopping centers, babysitting services, dry cleaners, and a host of other adjuncts. By the end of the century, the projects were completely self-sufficient, with food grown hydroponically in the sub-basements, separate floors set aside for schools and churches and factories robot ore-sleds capable of seeking out raw materials unavailable within the projects themselves and so on. And all because of, among other things, the population explosion. And the Treaty of Oslo. It seems there was a power struggle between two sets of then-existing nations, they were something like projects, only horizontal instead of vertical, and both sets were equipped with atomic weapons. The Treaty of Oslo began by stating that atomic war was unthinkable, and added that just in case anyone happened to think of it, only tactical atomic weapons could be used. No strategic atomic weapons. A tactical weapon is something you use on the soldiers, and a strategic weapon is something you use on the folks at home. Oddly enough, when somebody did think of the war, both sides adhered to the Treaty of Oslo which meant that no projects were bombed. Of course, they made up for this as best they could by using tactical atomic weapons all over the place. After the war almost the whole world was quite dangerously radioactive, except for the projects. Or at least those of them which had in time installed the force screens which had been invented on the very eve of battle, and which deflected radioactive particles. However, what with all the other treaties which were broken during the ungentlemanly gentleman's war, by the time it was finished nobody was quite sure any more who was on whose side. That project over there on the horizon might be an ally. And then again it might not. Since they weren't sure either, it was risky to expose yourself in order to ask. And so life went on, with little to remind us of the dangers lurking outside. The basic policy of eternal vigilance and instant preparedness was left to the army. The rest of us simply lived our lives and let it go at that. But now there was a spy in the elevator. When I thought of how deeply he had penetrated our defenses, and of how many others there might be still penetrating, I shuddered. 
The walls were our safeguards, only so long as all potential enemies were on the other side of them. I sat shaken, digesting this news, until suddenly I remembered Linda. I leaped to my feet, reading from my watch that it was now ten-fifteen. I dashed once more from the apartment and down the hall to the elevator, praying that the spy had been captured by now and that Linda would agree with me that a spy in the elevator was good and sufficient reason for me to be late. He was still there. At least the elevator was still out. I sagged against the wall, thinking dismal thoughts. Then I noticed the door to the right of the elevator. Through that door was the stairway. I hadn't paid any attention to it before. No one ever uses the stairs, except adventurous young boys playing cops and robbers, running up and down from landing to landing. I myself hadn't set foot on a flight of stairs since I was twelve years old. Actually, the whole idea of stairs was ridiculous. We had elevators, didn't we? Usually, I mean, when they didn't contain spies. So what was the use of stairs? Well, according to Dr. Kilbilly, a walking library of unnecessary information, the project had been built when there still had been such things as municipal governments, something to do with cities, which were more or less grouped projects. And the local municipal government had had on its books a fire ordinance, anachronistic even then, which required a complete set of stairs in every building constructed in the city. Ergo, the project had stairs, thirty-two hundred of them. And now, after all these years, the stairs might prove useful after all. It was only thirteen flights to Linda's floor. At sixteen steps a flight, that meant two hundred and eight steps. Could I descend two hundred and eight steps for my true love? I could, if the door would open. It would, though reluctantly. Who knew how many years it had been since last this door had been opened? It squeaked and wailed and groaned, and finally opened halfway. I stepped through to the musty, dusty landing, took a deep breath, and started down. Eight steps and a landing, eight steps and a floor. Eight steps and a landing, eight steps and a floor. On the landing between 150 and 149 there was a smallish door. I paused, looking curiously at it, and saw that at one time letters had been painted on it. The letters had long since flaked away, but they left a lighter residue of dust than that which covered the rest of the door, and so the words could still be read, if with difficulty. I read them. They said, Emergency entrance, elevator shaft, authorized personnel only, keep locked. I frowned, wondering immediately why this door wasn't being firmly guarded by at least a platoon of army men. Half a dozen possible answers flashed through my mind. The more recent maps might simply have omitted this discarded and unnecessary door. It might be sealed shut on the other side. The army might have caught the spy already. Somebody in authority might simply have goofed. As I stood there, pondering these possibilities, the door opened and the spy came out, waving a gun. 3. He couldn't have been anyone else but the spy. The gun in the first place, the fact that he looked harried and upset and terribly nervous in the second place, and, of course, the fact that he came from the elevator shaft. Looking back, I think he must have been just as startled as I when we came face to face like that. We formed a brief tableau, both of us open-mouthed and wide-eyed. Unfortunately, he recovered first. He closed the emergency door behind him, quickly but quietly. His gun stopped waving around and instead pointed directly at my middle. "'Don't move!' he whispered harshly. "'Don't make a sound!' I did exactly as I was told. I did not move and I didn't make a sound which left me quite free to study him. He was rather short, perhaps three inches shorter than me, with a bony, high-cheekboned face featuring deep-set eyes and a thin-lipped mouth. He wore gray slacks and shirt, with brown slippers on his feet. He looked exactly like a spy, which is to say that he didn't look like a spy. He looked overpoweringly ordinary. 
More than anything else, he reminded me of a rather taciturn milkman who used to make deliveries to my parents' apartment. His gaze darted this way and that. Then he motioned with his free hand at the descending stairs and whispered, "'Where do they go?' I had to clear my throat before I could speak. "'All the way down,' I said. "'Good,' he said, just as we both heard a sudden raucous squealing from perhaps four flights down, a squealing which could be nothing but the opening of a hall door. It was followed by the heavy thud of ascending boots. The army! But if I had any visions of imminent rescue, the spy dashed them. He said, "'Where do you live?' "'One fifty-three, I said. This was a desperate and dangerous man. I knew my only slim chance of safety lay in answering his questions promptly, cooperating with him until and unless I saw a chance to either escape or capture him. "'All right,' he whispered. "'Go on.' He prodded me with the gun. And so we went back up the stairs to 153, and stopped at the door. He stood close behind me, the gun pressed against my back, and grated in my ear. "'I'll have this gun in my pocket. If you make one false move, I'll kill you. Now we're going to your apartment. We're friends, just strolling along together. You got that?' I nodded. "'All right, let's go.' We went. I have never in my life seen that long hall quite so empty as it was right then. No one came out of any of the apartments. No one emerged from any of the branch halls. We walked to my apartment. I thumbed the door open, and we went inside. Once the door was closed behind us, he visibly relaxed, sagging against the door, his gun hand hanging limp at his side, a nervous smile playing across his lips. I looked at him judging the distance between us, wondering if I could leap at him before he could bring the gun up again. But he must have read my intentions on my face. He straightened, shaking his head. He said, "'Don't try it. I don't want to kill you. I don't want to kill anybody, but I will if I have to. We'll just wait here together until the hue and cry passes us. Then I'll tie you up, so you won't be able to sick your army on me too soon, and I'll leave.' If you don't try any silly heroics, nothing will happen to you." "'You'll never get away,' I told him. "'The whole project is alerted.' "'You let me worry about that,' he said. He licked his lips. "'You got any Chico coffee?' "'Yes.' "'Make me a cup, and don't get any bright ideas about dousing me with boiling water.' "'I only have my day's allotment,' I protested. "'Just enough for two cups, lunch and dinner.' Two cups is fine,' he said. "'One for each of us.' And now I had yet another grudge against this blasted spy, which reminded me again of Linda. From the looks of things, I wasn't ever going to get to her place. By now she was probably in mourning for me and might even have the sanitation staff searching for my remains. As I made the Chico, he asked me questions. My name first, and then, "'What do you do for a living?' I thought fast. I'm an ore sled dispatcher, I said. That was a lie, of course, but I'd heard enough about ore sled dispatching from Linda to be able to maintain the fiction should he question me further about it. Actually, I was a gymnast instructor. The subjects I taught included wrestling, judo, and karate, talents I would prefer to disclose to him in my own fashion when the time came. He was quiet for a moment. What about radiation level on the ore sleds? I had no idea what he was talking about, and admitted as such. When they come back, he said, how much radiation do they pick up? Don't you people ever test them? Of course not, I told him. I was on secure ground now, with Linda's information to guide me. All radiation is cleared from the sleds and their cargo before they're brought into the building. I know that, he said impatiently. But don't you ever check them before deradiating them? No, why should we? To find out how far the radiation level outside has dropped. For what? Who cares about that? He frowned bitterly. The same answer, he muttered, more to himself than to me. The same answer every time. 
You people have crawled into your caves and you're ready to stay in them forever. I looked around at my apartment. Rather a well-appointed cave, I told him. But a cave nevertheless. He leaned toward me, his eyes gleaming with a fanatical flame. Don't you ever wish to get outside? Incredible! I nearly poured boiling water all over myself. Outside? Of course not! The same thing, he grumbled, over and over again. Always the same stupidity. Listen, you, do you realize how long it took man to get out of the caves? The long, slow, painful creep of progress for millennia before he ever made that first step from the cave? I have no idea, I told him. I'll tell you this, he said belligerently, a lot longer than it took for him to turn around and go right back into the cave again. He started pacing the floor, waving the gun around in an agitated fashion as he talked. Is this the natural life of man? It is not. Is this even a desirable life for man? It is definitely not. He spun back to face me, pointing the gun at me again, but this time he pointed it as though it were a finger, not a gun. Listen, you, he snapped, man was progressing. For all his stupidities and excesses, he was growing up. His dreams were getting bigger and grander and better all the time. He was planning to tackle space. The moon first, and then the planets, and finally the stars. The whole universe was out there, waiting to be plucked like an apple from a tank. And man was reaching out for it. He glared as though daring me to doubt it. I decided that this man was doubly dangerous. Not only was he a spy, he was also a lunatic. So I had two reasons for humoring him. I nodded politely. So what happened? he demanded, and immediately answered himself. I'll tell you what happened. Just as he was about to make that first giant step, man got a hot foot. That's all it was, just a little hot foot. So what did man do? I'll tell you what he did. He turned around and he ran all the way back to the cave he started from, his tail between his legs. That's what he did." To say that all of this was incomprehensible would be an extreme understatement. I fulfilled my obligation to this insane dialogue by saying, "'Here's your coffee.' "'Put it on the table,' he said, switching instantly from raving maniac to watchful spy. I put it on the table. He drank deep, then carried the cup across the room and sat down in my favorite chair. He studied me narrowly, and suddenly said, "'What did they tell you I was, a spy?' "'Of course,' I said. He grinned bitterly with one side of his mouth. "'Of course. The damn fools. Spy. What do you suppose I'm going to spy on?' He asked the question so violently and urgently that I knew I had to answer quickly and well, or the maniac would return. I... I wouldn't know exactly, I stammered. Military equipment, I suppose? Military equipment? What military equipment? Your army is supplied with uniforms, whistles, and handguns, and that's about it. The defenses, I started. The defenses? he interrupted me, are non-existent. If you mean the rocket launchers on the roof, they're rusted through with age. And what other defenses are there? None. If you say so, I replied stiffly. The Army claimed that we had adequate defense equipment. I chose to believe the Army over an enemy spy. Your people send out spies too, don't they? he demanded. Well, of course. And what are they supposed to spy on? Well, it was such a pointless question. It seemed silly to even answer it. They're supposed to look for indications of an attack by one of the other projects. And do they find any indications, ever? I'm sure I don't know, I told him frostily. That would be classified information. You bet it would he said with malicious glee. All right, if that's what your spies are doing, and if I'm a spy, then it follows that I'm doing the same thing, right? I don't follow you, I admitted. If I'm a spy, 
he said impatiently. Then I'm supposed to look for indications of an attack by you people on my project. I shrugged. If that's your job, I said, then that's your job. He got suddenly red-faced and jumped to his feet. That's not my job, you blatant idiot! he shouted. I'm not a spy. If I were a spy, then that would be my job. The maniac had returned in full force. All right, I said hastily. All right, whatever you say. He glowered at me a moment longer, then shouted, Bah! and dropped back into the chair. He breathed rather heavily for a while, glaring at the floor, then looked at me again. All right, listen. What if I were to tell you that I had found indications that you people were planning to attack my project? I stared at him. That's impossible, I cried. We aren't planning to attack anybody. We just want to be left in peace. How do I know that? he demanded. It's the truth. What would we want to attack anybody for? Aha! he sat forward, tensed, pointing the gun at me like a finger again. Now then, he said, if you know it doesn't make any sense for this project to attack any other project, then why in the world should you think they might see some advantage in attacking you?" I shook my head, dumbfounded. "'I can't answer a question like that,' I said. "'How do I know what they're thinking?' "'They're human beings, aren't they?' he cried. "'Like you, like me, like all the other people in this mausoleum?' "'Now wait a minute. No,' he shouted. "'You wait a minute. I want to tell you something.' You think I'm a spy. That blundering army of yours thinks I'm a spy. That fathead who turned me in thinks I'm a spy. But I'm not a spy, and I'm going to tell you what I am." I waited, looking as attentive as possible. "'I come,' he said, "'from a project about eighty miles north of here. I came here by foot, without any sort of radiation shield at all to protect me.' The maniac was back. I didn't say a word. I didn't want to set off the violence that was so obviously in this lunatic. The radiation level, he went on, is way down. It's practically as low as it was before the Atom War. I don't know how long it's been that low, but I would guess about ten years at the very least. He leaned forward again, urgent and serious. The world is safe out there now. Man can come back out of the cave again. He can start building the dreams again, and this time he can build better, because he has the horrible example of the recent past to guide him away from the pitfalls. There's no need any longer for the projects. And that was like saying, there's no need any longer for stomachs, but I didn't say so. I didn't say anything at all. I'm a trained atomic engineer, he went on. In my project, I worked on the reactor. Theoretically, I believed that there was a chance the radiation outside was lessening by now, though we had no idea exactly how much radiation had been released by the atomic war. But I wanted to test the theory, and the Commission wouldn't let me. They claimed public safety, but I knew better. If the outside were safe and the projects were no longer needed, then the Commission was out of a job and they knew it. Well, I went ahead with the test anyway and I was caught at it. For my punishment, I was banned from the project. They kicked me out, telling me if I thought it was safe outside, I could live outside. And if it really was safe, I could come back and tell them. Except that they also made it clear that I would be shot if I tried to get back in, because I would be carrying deadly radiation." He smiled bitterly. They had it all their own way, he said. But it is safe out there. I'm living proof of it. I lived outside for five months. And gradually I realized I had to tell others. I had to spread the word that man could have his world back. I didn't dare try to get back into my own project. I would have been recognized and shot before I could say a word. So I came here." He paused to finish the cup of Chico that I should have had with lunch. I knew better he continued, 
than to simply walk into the building and announce that I came from outside. Man has an instinctive distrust for strangers anyway. The projects only intensify it. Once again, I would have been shot. So I've been working in a more devious way. I snuck into the project. Not a difficult thing for a man with no metal on his person, no radiation shield cocooning him, and for the last two months I have been wandering around the building, talking with people. I strike up a conversation. I try to plant a few seeds of doubt about the deadliness of outside, and I hope that at least a few of the people I talk to will begin to wonder, as I once did. Two months! This spy, by his own admission, had been in the project two months before being detected. I'd never heard of such a thing, and I hoped I'd never hear of such a thing again. Things worked out pretty well, he said, until today. I said something wrong, I'm still not sure what, and the man I was talking to hollered for army, shouted I was a spy. He pounded the chair arm. But I'm not a spy, and it's the truth. Outside is safe. He glared suddenly at the window. Why have you got that drape up there? The window broke down, I explained. It stuck at transparent. Transparent? Fine. He got up from the chair, strode across the room, and ripped the drape down from the window. I cowered away from the sun glare, turning my back to the window. Come over here, he shouted. When I didn't move, he snarled, Get up and come over here, or I swear I'll shoot. And he would have, it was plain in his voice. I got to my feet, hesitant, and walked trembling to the window, squinting against the glare. Look out there, he ordered. Look! I looked. 4. Terror, horror, dizziness and nausea. Far and away and far, nothing and nothing. Only the glare, and the high blue, and the far, far horizon, and the broken gray slag stretching out way down below. Do you see? he demanded. Look down there. We're so high up it's hard to see, but look for it. Do you see it? Do you see the green? Do you know what that means? There are green things growing again outside. Not much yet. It's only just started back, but it's begun. The radiation is down. Plants are growing again. The power of suggestion. And, of course, the heightened sensitivity caused by the double threat of a man beside me carrying a gun and that yawning, aching expanse of nothing beyond the window. I nearly fancy that I did see faint specks of green. Do you see it? he asked me. Wait, I said. I leaned closer to the window, though every nerve in me wanted to leap the other way. Yes, I said. Yes, I see it. Green. He sighed, a long, painful sigh of thanksgiving. Then, now you know, he said. I've been telling you the truth. It is safe outside. And my lie worked. For the first time, his guard was completely down. I moved like a whirlwind. I leaped and twisted his arm in a hard hammerlock, which caused him to cry out and drop the gun. That was wrestling. Then I turned and twisted and dipped, causing him to fly over my head and crash to the floor. That was judo. Then I jabbed one rigid forefinger against a certain spot on the side of his neck, causing the blood in his veins to forever stop its motion. That was karate. Well, by the time the army men had finished questioning me it was three o'clock in the afternoon, and I was five hours late. The army men corroborated my belief that the man had been a spy, who had apparently lost his mind when cornered in the elevator. Outside was still dangerous, of course, they assured me of that, and he'd been lying about having been here two months. He'd been in the project less than two days. Not only that, the army men told me they'd found the radiation-proof car he'd driven, and in which he had hoped to drive back to his own project once he discovered all our defenses. Despite the fact that I had the most legitimate excuse for tardiness under the roof, Linda refused to forgive me for not making our ten o'clock meeting. When I asked her to marry me, she refused, at length and descriptively. 
but I was surprised and relieved to discover how rapidly I got over my heartbreak. This was aided by the fact that once the news of my exploit spread, there were any number of girls more than anxious to get to know me better, including the well-cleavaged young lady from the transit staff. After all, I was a hero. They even gave me a medal. The End of The Spy in the Elevator by Ronald E. Westlake